Well, good morning. Welcome to First United Methodist Church. If you would stand up with us as we worship this morning. about what God's going to do today. If you are a guest, we're extremely excited that you're here. In fact, we have a gift for you. It holds caffeine. It's a great uh, little receptacle to have on hand. And it looks like cats back there today. So make sure if you're a guest, you stop by our welcome desk and uh, get that gift. It's a great way to ask any questions about our church. We'd love to, to answer those for you. For everybody else in the room, if you have a bulletin, there's this little tear-off portion called our Connect card. You can tear that off, fill that out. That's how we know that you're here this morning. That's also a way for you to communicate with us. If you have a particular uh, prayer need or there's something you need from our pastoral team or you have some questions about becoming a follower of Jesus or joining a group or serving, that's a great way to communicate that. And we'll collect those later on during our offering. 
Also, if you look in the chair back in front of you, there are prayer request cards. If you have a joy that you just want to celebrate with the church, or if you have a, a need that you'd like to lift up in prayer, uh, we dedicate a, a section of our time and needs service to, to lift those prayer needs up. So fill that out, and we'll pick those up uh, here later on in the service. All right, if you'll stand with me, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get right back into worship. Father in heaven, uh, I know for many of us this has been a challenging week uh, throughout our community and our schools. Uh, sickness has been running rampant. Uh, there are plenty of moms and dads who've been up late this week taking care of their kids. There have been plenty of people in here who just uh, haven't got a lot of good rest. And so we need you, Lord Jesus, this morning. We need you to energize us. We need you to Restore us and strengthen us. We need you to give us the ability to, to tune in beyond the, the physical things going on around us. Give us the capacity, Father, to, to realize that, that spiritual work is at hand among us. That supernatural power is available to us. Help us to, to really tune in to that truth. May we receive everything, Father. May we willingly receive everything that you have for us this morning. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Oh 
continue standing if you can. If you want to sit down, you can. I just, uh, as we were worshiping, I just thought about how quickly we rush from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, both in our lives, but also in our church services. So I just, I just feel this need to just linger for a moment. So I just want us to linger here and just enjoy the Lord's presence. We're not doing anything. We're not saying anything. We're just resting in those wide open arms of love of Christ. We just rest in this moment. about you and I didn't want that moment to end, but uh, you guys might fire me if we get out of here at one o'clock, so uh, we better, better take our next step. At this time, we want to invite our children to come forward for children's time, and while they're doing that, uh, if you have a prayer request, if you have a need, please fill that out and, and pass those to the center aisle here in just a moment. We'll collect those. Uh, just go ahead and get those filled out, and we'll pick those up here in just a moment.
who God made a judge over the land. The people thought she was pretty smart. Every day she sat under a palm tree, and she would help people with their problems. The Bible tells us that Deborah was a prophet. A prophet is a person God talks to and uses them to share messages with his people. Deborah loved God and trusted him. One day, God told Deborah to find a man named Barak and tell him to get an army together and go to battle. God said it was time to get his people away from the enemy who took them over. Barak got scared and said he would only go if Deborah went with him. Because Deborah trusted God, she went. Can you imagine a woman who sat under a palm tree every day, talking about problems, going into battle, and probably with a dress on? Not only did she go, she told Barak he couldn't take credit for winning, and they did win that battle. Here's what I want you to learn from Deborah. God took a girl who people like to talk to about their problems, who sat in a dress under a palm tree every day. Deborah wasn't a big, strong soldier who trained for battle, but when God called her, she said what? What did she say? She said yes. And he made her strong and kept her safe. God gave Deborah the strength to lead an army that won. We may think we aren't strong enough or big enough or brave enough, but when God needs you, he will give you exactly what you need to do the job. Are you ready? Let's pray. Lord, we don't want to be afraid. We are not big enough or strong enough or brave enough. Help us to trust in you always. Amen. People hand you and bring those to me. That would be great. So if you have a prayer request this morning, please pass it to the center aisle and we'll get those picked up and uh, prayed over this morning. this morning. Uh, first, so this is a praise. Uh, they just want to praise God for all he has done for us and not to lose focus on him during the hard times. Amen. We praise the Lord that he's faithful during the hard times. Amen. Cooper, is it okay if I read this out loud? See you here. All right, I messed you up last time. I want to make sure I don't mess up again this week. So this is from Scott Cooper. Uh, he, his request is more of God's love, uh, capital L, uh, and he specifies the love of God that he wants is the agape love, love for the Lord's people uh, in the panhandle, specifically FMC and the Wesley Foundation, that we would be, that we would be uh, taken to the next level in our relationship with him. Amen. Can we all agree to pray to grow closer in our relationship with God? Amen. Thank you, Scott. Is it okay if I read this one out loud, Scott? Yes. All right, cool. I'll just double check it. I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't do anything wrong. So again, this is from Scott. This is a praise. He says, "I'm so thankful for this church in choosing to love and say yes to Jesus. Uh, Y'all prayed for me to be healed, and I am. Amen. Amen." Amen. So this is from uh, Caleb and Kayla. Uh, they request a prayer for their mom and mother-in-law uh, who work for the same company. Uh, this week, uh, the company closed their branch and let them go do the downsizing, uh, praying that God will provide uh, for both of them their job soon. So we should be praying for uh, Caleb and Kayla's mom this morning. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so this is an awkward prayer request because it's uh, for me. Um, if you would... Uh, Continue to pray uh, for my stomach to be healed. Um, I had some sort of plague. I don't know what it was, but uh, I'm about 85 percent right now. So uh, don't worry, you'll get 100 percent sermon. Don't panic. Uh, and then we uh, actually, in all seriousness, we love prayers uh, for our niece Molly. Um, she has had a, a significantly bad reaction to an antibiotic and has uh, blisters and burning sores all over her body. 
so we would really appreciate he, uh, prayers for quick healing for her. So uh, please be praying for us. Uh, and then Chris uh, Friel has a, prayer, or a phrase. He said he's thankful for the daddy-daughter dinner dance and for all who helped uh, put it together. And it was a great time. So amen. Can we just, amen. That's awesome. It was, it was awesome. I never dreamed of going to Candyland, but I had to go last night. So it was awesome. And then this prayer request uh, is for healing over my family. We all know how hard families are and, and difficult. So who's going to be praying for healing for families this morning? Amen. Thank you. This prayer request is from Ashley. Ashley here. Uh, she said, Christina Farley has torn her rotator cuff. Is unsure if surgery is needed. So uh, can we pray for Christina that surgery won't be needed and she'll be healed? Let's be bold this morning. Thank you. So this morning, I'm going to invite um, Angela Asbill up. She's going to pray for, pray for our prayer request and pray for us this morning. Uh, she'll give you guys just a moment to pray over whatever the Lord laid on your heart, and then she'll pray for us, and we'll move forward with our service. up the broken heart and heals the wounds. I just felt your longing to heal the broken hearts that are here today, God, to bind them up. And Lord, so many times our hearts break because they've grown hard and brittle. And God, you also say you want to give us a soft heart and a new heart. So I pray, Father, that the things that have made our hearts brittle and hard towards you thus have caused brokenness. I pray, Lord, that you would heal us from unforgiveness and from anger and from all the places we've built up walls and said we'd never let anyone close to us again. I pray that you would give us new hearts of flesh and that you would heal the wounds, God, and you would pour your salve and your oil upon our hearts and make us new again, Jesus. Give us hearts of flesh. And Lord, I know when a bone is broken and reset when it heals, it heals stronger than it ever was before. So I pray that as you heal the broken heart and today, God, that those hearts would be made stronger than they ever were before. And I thank you for this. And we say the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. And thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of God. Amen. The scripture today is Judges 5 7. The peasantry prospered in Israel. They grew fat on plunder because you arose, Deborah, arose as a mother in Israel. This is the word of God for the people. So before I jump into our sermon, can I tell you something that I hope you already know? We have an awesome church. It's an awesome church. I mean, and let me tell you why it's awesome. Because we have awesome people. 
That's what makes our church awesome. I mean, I don't know if you, you picked up on this morning, but Jason's out today, so Roman was able to step up. We have adults leading our, our children's time. Andrew comes to me in the middle of the service. Hey, the Lord's burned my heart. Something can I pray? We have awesome people in this church. Can we, can we just celebrate that this morning? Yeah, we just have an awesome church. Because of our awesome people. It's good to be here this morning. I hope you're excited to be here. I'm excited to be here. So... So I, I'm going to tell you, uh, this today's sermon is a little awkward. Now, it's not quite as awkward as last week's sermon. Uh, if you were here last week, uh, most awkward sermon I've ever preached, but one of the, one of the, one of the sermons I'm doing the most, I have to say. Uh, this one's a little awkward, but not quite that bad. So when it comes to remarkable people in the Old Testament, we don't have to look very far, and we don't have to look very, very much further than... Deborah. Now I want you to notice I said people, not just women. See, Deborah was truly remarkable. And we see that in just a few lines in the book of Judges. Early on uh, in the chapter that she's mentioned in the book of Judges, we realize how remarkable she is. And, and Deborah is introduced to us in the book of Judges, chapter 4. And so I just want to read straight from chapter 4 our introduction uh, to, to, to who Deborah is. This is what it says. Uh, Judges 4, 4 through 6. At that time, Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. She used to sit under a palm, uh, under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinom, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take Take position at Mount Tabor, bringing 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and then from the tribe of Zebulun. Now, if you were living in the time and the culture that this text was written in, when I read that, you would have gasped. You would have said, oh, what? Really? Are you serious? Is that, 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 is that true? Is that really, is that, is that happening right now? It's, and it's easy for us to miss because, because we, number one, we don't pay attention many times. We just read the text. But we also didn't come from the culture. And we talked a lot about that last week, how important it is to understand the culture uh, that the text takes place in. And, and that's what's frustrating about the Bible many times uh, because the Bible often does that to us. It doesn't give us all the great details that we want. Many times it just gives us the bare bones of the story. And it's easy for us to miss the, the, the deep and the impactful truth if we don't slow down and we don't take a moment to ponder what is happening within the cultural context of the story that we're reading. And so I'm going to read for us again some of the remarkable things that we might have missed. Deborah, a prophetess, wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel. We hear from the very beginning of our introduction of Deborah that she was a prophet. Now, what is a prophet? A prophet is someone who speaks on behalf of God. And these people, they're listening to Deborah. They're listening to her. And this is just, this is just one piece that actually elevates her status. She's a prophetess. She is literally the mouthpiece of God for the nation of Israel at this time in history. Now, it also states that she is the, the wife of Lapidoth. Now, let me tell you what we know about Lapidoth. Nothing. Nothing. He was never mentioned before this in Scripture, and he will never be mentioned again uh, through the, for the remainder of Scripture revelation. We don't know anything about Lapidoth. All we know is that he was the husband of Deborah. And then the scriptures goes on to state that Deborah was judging Israel. Now we need to we need to kind of understand that a little bit. It wasn't like she was like, ooh, look what they're wearing. Not that kind of judging, okay? She was in this time a judge was someone who leads. Because at this time in the nation of Israel there were no kings. Joshua has died. So they don't have a identified leader, a military leader. So in this time in the nation of Israel, judges were the leaders. 
and Deborah was the judge. She was someone who would settle disputes. She would give advice. She was viewed as a savior and a deliverer for the nation of Israel. She delivered them from their enemies, and she helped them understand their calling to live for God. The, the judge was tasked with the responsibility of bringing shalom, bringing peace to the people. So in this one sentence, this one short little sentence in the introduction, we see that Deborah is a woman who speaks on God's behalf. She leads the whole nation of Israel, and she is divinely appointed by God even above her husband. But there's even more. I'm going to continue reading. It says, she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came up to her for judgment. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. The place that she hung out became known as the palm of Deborah. How much swagger, how much influence, how much leadership do you have to have for the place that you hang out to be called the Palm of Deborah? I mean, how, raise your hand if you've ever bumped into Rick Inns at Palace Coffee. Right? Don't be shy. We all know he's there all the time. It's okay. That's his place. It's not called Rick's. Right? <laughs> and he's a man of great influence and wisdom, and he's there all the time. But Deborah, the place that she's at, it's not called the Palms, it's called the Palm of Deborah. The people of Israel were coming to her. She was known to hang out there, and because she was known to hang out there, the people gathered around her for judgment and wisdom. And not just women, men and women were coming to Deborah for judgment. They were depending on her leadership because she led the nation. Now check out the next line. This is amazing. She sent, this is the verse, she sent and summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you to go. I love this one. I love this one. She summons Barak. Now, who's Barak? Barak is a military commander of the army. She summons him, and he shows up. He doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't say, oh, what's this about? I don't know what you want to tell me. Why don't you just send me an update letter before I show up? He just shows up. Now, and, and understanding a little bit of biblical geography will help us understand the significance of Barak showing up at the command of Deborah because the distance between Deborah and Barak was, was pretty significant. It was, not, it was not an easy trip. It was not a quick trip. In fact, it would have taken 10 days to walk from where Barak was to where Deborah was. So in essence, Deborah said jump and Barak said how high? She responded to his, to her, he responded to her leadership and her influence. Because as a prophet, she spoke on behalf of God, and she told Barak that God said, go. Now, a lot of the details on Deborah, there's a lot of other details on Deborah, uh, but, I'm sorry, I got excited, I lost my place, give me just a second. So, we're limited on some of our details on Deborah. So we have to... Do good Bible study and read between the lines and, and understand what the author assumes that we understand. Because it says here that here we have a judge of Israel who is a woman. And you remember last week, if you were here last week, you understand the significance of that, of that comment. The majority of the Bible was written by men in a patriarchal society, and, and, and the Bible was primarily written to men who had the power and who had the control, right? But here we have Deborah, a woman, prophetess, who is the judge of Israel. God in Deborah provided a great model and a great perspective for us of how one woman 
who allowed God's influence in her life, was able to shape an entire nation. I love during the, the, during the, the children's time, we talk about that Deborah was probably hanging out under the palm of Deborah in a dress. But in the reality, despite how she was dressed, because she allowed God to influence her life and she was submitted to what he called her to do, Deborah was in essence a mighty warrior of God. Now, let's dive in a little bit more in the story. Again, as I said before, we are in the time of the judges of Israel. And this takes place after the death of Joshua, of Joshua who su succeeded Moses in power. And Joshua was a great leader. He was a general of Israel. Remember, after, and just to get you caught up, remember, after Egypt, the people of God wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses led during that time. And then as they were about to transition into the promised land, Joshua took over leadership and led them into the promised land. And they began to conquer the land. But after Joshua, it, it gets dark. After Joshua, we began to see the nation crumble. And we see this in the book of Judges. And I have to say this. Uh, the book of Judges is rough. It's rough. It's difficult to read. Rick says that, that, that he hates the book of Judges. And he prefaces that with that's probably a strong word. But it's rough and it's easy to hate because in the book of Judges, we get a front seat view and, a, and a, just a bold reminder of the depravity of man. The ugliness of of men whose hearts have grown cold towards God. And as you read the book, you begin to see the downfall of a nation. You get to peek into the failings and the faults of our ancestors at a time when they began to rebel against God's word. And they began to seek after other gods. And they began to wickedly twist God's laws to try to fit their will. But then, in this dark book that's easy to hate, it's easy to avoid. We have a ray of light. We have a bright spot with the story of Deborah. And her story, if you want to read it, is told in chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Judges. Chapter 4 is the narration of the events, and chapter 5 is actually a poem about Deborah and her exploits. And here's what I love about that. We talked about this a little bit last week, about how the Bible was written uh, to be uh, orally shared. This poem was written and designed in such a way that you would have to imagine uh, just a bunch of people sitting around a campfire. And say, hey, tell, tell the poem of Deborah. Tell, tell, that's one of my favorite stories. Tell that poem. Share that story. And her name and her renown would have been shared around campfires to children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And I love the text that we read in, Judge, in Judges chapter 5, verse seven, 7. It says, Deborah arose as a mother in Israel. I love that image. Deborah arose as a mother in Israel. If there's anybody who needed a mom, it was the nation of Israel. Okay? They needed someone to keep them in check. Now, we don't know if Deborah had any children, but she led the nation of Israel as a mother. And, and motherhood, to me, is a role that was actually created by God. I believe that all women, whether they have children or not, are in fact deeply equipped and called to be mothers. Whether they mother their own children, or they mother a church, or they mother a classroom, I think women are endowed with this great ability to mother. In fact, I love this quote by Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa said, the title of mother is the greatest honor I have ever received. And Mother Teresa never had children. I just think that's a great perspective for us to have. Now, let's get back to the story. Chapter 4 starts with these terrible words that if you read the book of Judges, you'll hear over and over and over again at nauseam. Uh, verse 1 of 4 says, The Israelites, be, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. But even with that verse, we find a glimmer of God's hope in the midst of all this sinfulness. And that hope comes through Deborah, the mighty warrior of God that we've been talking about. But, but here's where it gets interesting. 
because there's actually another woman in this story who is also a mighty warrior of God. So I want to tell that story. In the days of the judges, when Israel didn't have a king, the people did what was evil inside the Lord. We've been over that. And God had given them into the hands of a Canaanite king, King Jabin. Okay? Boo. Right? Boo on Jabin. And King Jabin had a mighty military commander named Sisera. Boo on Sisera, right? Boo on them. Now here's what's interesting. Sisera's army was well equipped. And it was well trained uh, to, to, to do battle. In fact, Sisera had 900 chariots of iron. So translate that. He had 900 tanks. 900 armored vehicles. And with that army and with that equipment, uh, he oppressed the nation of Israel for 20 years. And the Israelites, under that oppression, began to call out to God, and they cried for a great military commander uh, to lead them so that they might break the yoke of oppression from their necks. They needed a great leader. They needed someone like General Patton or General Washington or maybe Eisenhower. So who did God send? A woman. He sent a woman. He sent Deborah, who we've already been introduced to. So Deborah received the word from God, God, and she calls the commander of, Israel, of Israel's army, Barak, and she tells him, God is telling you to go and set up your army at Mount Tabor, and Sisera will come out to fight you, and God will give, into your, give him into your hand, and you'll win a great victory. That sounds pretty good. Right? Never saying, you got a guaranteed dub here. You show up, you fight, God's going to win, it's going to be great, you're going to be famous, you're going to defeat uh, Sisera, this horrible person, this horrible general who's oppressed our people. But what does Barak do? He says, he won't go unless Deborah goes with him. What he's doing is he's trying to hedge his bet. He's gotten this, this, this calling from God, and he knows that Deborah is a prophetess of God, and he knows that she speaks on God's behalf, but he didn't trust the word that she said. So he's trying to hedge his, his bet and, and, and expect more from God, even though God's already told him what to do. Uh, now here's where it, it, it gets a little gangster. I love this part. It's, it's awesome. Here's how Deborah replies. Okay, I'll go. But you won't get any of the glory from the battle. You will just be a side note. And more than that, a woman will kill the great general Cicero. And he will be delivered into the hands of a woman. Boom! That's the sound of the mic dropping. When she dropped the mic right there in front of Barack. Right? Here's what's sad. Barack, Barack had an opportunity to act. He had an opportunity to trust what God had said to him. He had the opportunity to put in all of his faith in what God said that God would do through Deborah. But instead, he, he demanded a guarantee. He demanded assurances from God, even though God had already spoken. And because of that, he lost the opportunity to be blessed by God. How many times do we cross ourselves? God tells us to do something. We say, ah, well, 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 well. Yeah, give me a guarantee. I need to know how this is going to go, go down. And we lose this opportunity to be blessed. Now, at this point in the story, we would all assume that this woman who's going to gain this great victory from the nation of Israel, who's going to defeat the great general Sisera, is going to be Deborah. But right here in this moment of the story is where we're introduced to two new main characters. We're introduced to Heber, the Kenite, and Jael, his wife. Now, the text tells us that the Kenites are actually descendants of, of Moses' father. But Heber had actually made a pact with Jabin. Remember Jabin? Ooh, Jabin, right? Uh, Jabin, uh, the Canaanite king, he made a pact with him. And so he was not on Israel's side. He was not for Israel, he, and he was not at risk of any danger when Sisera came to do battle with Israel. Now, let's get back to the battle plan. As Sisera's army is facing uh, Barak's army, the text tells us that the Lord sent Sisera's army, remember, Sisera, sent his army into a panic. And Israel, Israel begins to, to rout Sisera. Now, they didn't do anything amazing. They just showed up. 
Israel's army just showed up and they're faced off against uh, Sisera's army and the Lord does the work. And how, how many of you know, I'm saying this to people who probably know this, half the battle is showing up. God says go. Half the battle is just going where he tells you to go and waiting on him to win the victory. So Sisera's army is thrown into a panic. Uh, they, the Israel begin to, the Israelites begin to chase them down and pick them off. And so Sisera flees the battlefield and seeks shelter in the tent of Jael, wife of heaven. So Jael invites him into her tent, gives him some milk to drink. She allows him uh, to rest. And Sisera tells Jael, don't let anyone inside the tent. And if anyone asks you if anyone's in here, you just say, no, no one's in my tent. So she covers him to hiding, and he falls fast asleep. Okay, anybody hearing the Jaws music? No, no, no. It's going to get dangerous for Cicero. Now, what, that's what comes next. It's so unexpected. It's, it's just amazing. This is kind of where it might get awkward for some of you, but this is just an amazing story in our Bible. Judges 4.21 says this. But J.M., wife of heaven, took a tent peg, and she took a hammer in her hand, and she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple until it went into the ground, and he was laying fast asleep from weariness, and he died. <laughs> what? Did that just happen? This, this is one of the things that, just side note, I promise I'll get back and forth. This is what kind of drives me crazy about, about, about the Bible. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about dinosaurs, but right here it says the dude with the tin peg in his head died. We know, right? We know he's dead. You don't have to say that. This is so amazing. Tin peg to the head. Man, all you guys play Fortnite, you use the wrong weapons. You gotta go hammer tin peg. It's the way to go. So it's the only way to go. If you don't know what that is, ask this section and they'll tell you what Fortnite is. They'll show you some dances. It'll be awesome. So, here's what's really amazing. Now, that's amazing. That's shocking. But here's what's amazing. JL actually risked her life to deliver a people that weren't even her people. And most likely, she wasn't even an Israelite. And her husband had made a pact with Sisera, which meant that, she, that Sisera wasn't even a threat to her. In fact, if she would have aided him, hidden him, protected him, helped him get back to safety, that might have meant a reward for her. So why did she do it? Why did she do it? Because it was the right thing to do. We'll find out later on that Sisera was a horrible person. We'll find out later she was a horrible person. So it was the right thing to do. Now it's even more amazing to realize that, that, that only two tribes of Israel gathered to fight. The other ten tribes, they didn't even bother showing up. They stayed home. They stayed in the war beds. They didn't even show up. And here we have a woman in a patriarchal culture who risked her life, risked her family, and risked her future to do the will of God. She wins the battle. J.L. gets the glory for destroying, destroying Jabin's army. So now what do we need to take from this? I don't want you to take from this. Ten pegs and hammer song and ball. That's wrong. Don't take that from this. First, we need to take from this that God often uses seemingly weaker things of the world to confound the seemingly wise. With Deborah, God gives her gifts in such a way that we're unique among the other judges. She is a judge that is not fitted with military training, but she is gifted to find leaders to get the job done because God called her to do that job. Only Moses and Samuel had similar unique roles as Deborah. She could, as a prophetess, discern the will of God and communicate it to others. The, the second lesson that I think uh, Deborah reveals, and, and really that JL's actions reveal, is that we're shaped and influenced, we should be shaped and influenced by God and not the influences of the world. JL ignored what her inaction could guarantee her and was faithful to God's will 
that really at that point offered no guarantees. It only offered risk. But because of her faithfulness, because of her courage, because of her willingness to be a mighty warrior for God, Deborah had an epic poem written about her that is told from generation to generation to generation. You can read it if you go to Judges chapter 5. It's actually one of the oldest scriptures, the oldest text that we have. And we refer to it as the Song of Deborah. You know, we need more, we need more Deborahs in the world. We need more people who are willing to stand up and do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Despite the risk, despite the challenges, despite the unknown. And here's the result of, of Deborah's faithfulness. It says in Judges 5-7, there were few people left in the villages of Israel until Deborah arose as a mother of Israel. Now, here's what I want to ask everybody, not just, not just the women. Where do you need to stand up? Where do you need to take a risk to be faithful to what God is calling you to do? And, why aren't you doing it? Why? Is it because you're afraid that you're weak? tell you something. You are. You are weak. I'm weak. Deborah was weak. J.L. was weak. But what we see consistently through scripture is how God will take the weak and do mighty things with them. I want to remind you, if you feel like you're weak, too weak to be faithful to what God's calling you to do, I want to remind you what 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10 says. Now, this is Paul talking. Uh, he says, three times I appealed to the Lord about this, this thorn in his flesh, that it would leave me. But he said to me, this is the Lord's words, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in power. No, my power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ, Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content in my weaknesses, in my insults, in my hardships, in my persecutions, in my calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, I am strong. So if you sit here today and God is calling you to do something and you feel weak, Church, let me tell you, you are primed to watch God do something mighty with that faith. That's all you need to contribute. You just have to show up. You just have to show up. And God's great power will work mightily through your weakness. That's right. Father in heaven, help us to trust you. Uh, I say those words, but I know. When you feel weak, you don't want to. You don't want to take risks. When you feel weak, you don't want to go to battle. And help us. Give us great courage, Lord Jesus, to trust that when we are weak, there is room for you to be mighty. And I also pray, Father, for this offering that we're about to receive. I pray, Father, that this would be a demonstration of our willingness to trust in our weakness, to give of ourselves, to give a little bit of our safety, to give a little bit of our comfort, to give a little bit of our, our, our guarantee to you, trusting that you can do something mighty with it. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll begin uh, receiving uh, our tithes and offerings as they are passed around. Uh, go ahead and put your uh, offering in there, but also your debt card as you fill that out. Oh. 
talk for just a moment about some things going on in the life of our church. Uh, first, I want to invite you to our uh, to the Wesley's Wild Wesley Home Down, uh, March second at seven p.m. Yeah, y'all clap for that. It's fun. It's a ton of fun. You get great food. You get to dance. Uh, it's, it's it's awesome. It's a great fundraiser for the Wesley. I want to invite everybody to come and be a part of that. Also, I'm really excited. Uh, Mark Pittman is leading a group, or a seminar actually, called Money Matters on March 2nd as well at 8.30 a.m. Uh, it's going to be focused on uh, understanding our relationship with money, uh, our, our, the choices that are available to us, and how to respond in the light of our faith. It's going to be great. Anyone who's uh, struggling uh, to manage your money or just wants more information on how to manage your money better, uh, that's a great opportunity for you. You can see some information in there. Uh, also, the last thing I want to say, I want to say thank you. I guess, to all of you for the way that you responded to our 30-hour famine. And the reason I say I guess is because we met our goal, which is awesome. It's amazing. Uh, we met our goal of $5,000, which means through your help, we were able to feed and care for 10 children for an entire year. So we really, really appreciate that. Yeah. The reason I say I guess is because of, because of your generosity, uh, Rick and myself and many of the youth staff are going to have to do some horrible things on March 20th. Uh, that's a Wednesday night. Uh, Rick will be shaving his beard. Uh, his entire family's mad at me, right? His entire family's mad at me. But uh, I will be shaving my head, which my entire family is mad at me. So, uh, it, but it was for a great cause. If we have some other things, you need to ask Wes, you need to ask uh, Carolyn what she's going to have to do. It's going to be hilarious. So be watching Facebook, Mar uh, February 20th, 21st. We're going to have some great pictures up. But in all seriousness, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we could not have done it without you. So proud of our students, so proud of our church. Uh, you've helped save the lives of 10 children for an entire year. We really appreciate that. So, and if you see me with the bald head, I did not enjoy the cold. It just, I made a bad bet and I lost. So it is what it is. <laughs> Here's this benediction. You are weak, but your God is so strong. May that be encouraged to do his work. Go in his name.